Hey, hey, welcome to Over the Horizon. If you're like me and you're still recovering from the excitement of that brilliant Starship IFT4 test launch, then you're going to like our chat today. We'll be talking Starship successful re-entry, those brilliant plasma colors that we witnessed, and the physics behind that phenomenon. Is it a bit like the Aurora Borealis? We'll get to know. And there's much, much more, so stay tuned. This is going to be a really exciting one. All right, so let me first bring in my guest today on Over the Horizon. I have Dr. Scott Walter. He's a mechanical and aerospace engineer. And Dr. Ed Bob is a consultant and subject matter expert on ultra-high temperature materials and heat shields. He's back with us after a brief while. It's good to have you back, Ed. Um, you know, let's start off with that brilliant display of plasma. Uh, Scott, can you help us understand the physics behind this phenomenon? What's causing it? There's a lot of discussion whether it was friction or whether it was compression of the air under the starship. What's going on? Help us understand this. Well, in the, in the end, it's all about heating. So if you get a gas hot enough, it's going to eventually glow as it sort of turns into a plasma. And it all comes down to um, uh, quantum mechanics and what we may remember from our chemistry classes and physics classes about the different orbitals that different elements have uh, of the electrons. And so when the electrons move from one level to another, uh, each element does it a little bit differently, which means they put out a slightly different wavelength of light. And from that, we can tell what kind of gas is um, primarily being heated at that point. And so the different right. colored gases will tell you whether it's oxygen or whether it's sulfur or whether it's nitrogen as you go through. And I think uh, the same effect that happens with the auroras. So whether you're, you're mm. heating it from the, the, the friction turning of plasma this way or whether it's being bombarded like it was during the auroras, you, you pretty much should be able to get the same colors if it's oxygen creating the color or if it's nitrogen or something else. Um, now, as far as what's causing the heating, it's a bit of both. There's the compression and then there's the heating. And the compression, of course, you just take the gas and you squeeze it tightly. And if you remember the ideal gas law, it pretty much tells you that as you start to squeeze something like that, the temperature of the gas is going to go up and it's going to increase depending upon how you do it. Um, right. And if anyone's taken a bicycle pump, you certainly know that, that you've got friction from the cylinder that's going up and down. But if you actually go mm -hmm. a little bit away from it where the, the gas is going through the tube to get out to your pump and you touch that, it's going to get very, very hot. That's just That comes from the compression. So there's definitely some compression of the air as the vehicle slams up against it, it's going to get compressed, which will cause the heating. But there's also friction. And the reason oh, we, we okay. can say there's friction yeah. confidently is, is what is friction? Friction is effectively something that prevents you from being able to move forward, it slows you down. It's something we call drag, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can say, well, since there's some drag going on there too, there's also some friction. It's just a question of, you know, what's whether it's 80, 90% of one or the other. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, it's it's and, really yeah. fascinating. Uh, you know, in addition to the constituents of the upper atmosphere, you know, nitrogen, oxygen, and so forth, uh, as we saw in the video clip, uh, the ma the material itself is disintegrating. Your tiles are coming apart. Metal is being exposed to the extreme heat of the reentry. And because it's decomposing, ions are coming off. And you have what's called thermoluminescence, where when you heat materials, particularly transition elements and lanthanides, uh, to very high temperatures, they thermoluminesce. And they all have different colors. So one could take the spectra of this and, uh, you know, looking very carefully, you could identify perhaps some of the elements, one of them is probably going to be chromium. Um, the SX300 uh, steel, stainless steel alloy that uh, SpaceX has developed it is a high chromium containing alloy and their SX500 that they're using for some of the 3D printing and engines uh, is even more. Uh, I mean, this is great that here, SpaceX is pioneering its own metallurgy uh, as part of its program. And in material science, people thought metallurgy was dead. Well, no one told that to Elon. Exactly. <laughs> so, but 
you're you're seeing a lot of material coming off and you see all the bright little bits uh yeah. that's material that's parts of your tiles which is silica alumina and and part of the metal the underlying hinge or actuator for the flap has been exposed this is something i was worried about in mm -hmm. uh, in our uh webcast of a few months ago after ift3 right. right. i was very concerned about how well protected the joint is and and well, the answer is not well. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we just saw a big piece of tile. Hey, but but to the end. credit of that of that heat of that flap, it stayed on. You've oh, got to give it some bonus points for staying on. That okay, is one, one <laughs> tough little flap. That is the Time Magazine flap of the year. Flap of the year. <laughs> and if that little flap hadn't stayed on the vehicle aerodynamically. Uh, they would not have been able to uh, control it on its re-entry and landing. So uh, that little flap deserves a medal uh, for medal of honor in there for dear life, and uh, and it did. You can see in the image that is on the screen uh, whole parts of this back end of the flap coming off of it. Um, it's it's not a failure of the flap the flap is trying to do its best to to hang on and steer the vehicle it's the failure of the heat shield system right right yeah. let's mess and it you're, up you're the flap hypersonics is... material and heat tiles expert so yeah. when you look at this um are you still uh are you still confident that the the wiser route for spacex would be to change the material of the tiles. Yes, absolutely, I am. I, I think um, you know they they made tiles based on the highly porous, lightweight, mostly silica-based tiles developed in the early seventies, so, you know, for the space shuttle, which was a great material in its day, and um, you know adapted it for Starship, but it had problems back then it wasn't the it wasn't perfect but it was the best they had and it, and they made it work this vehicle design and operation is much more aggressive than the space shuttle um space shuttle did not have forward flaps and things that actuated there it was a smooth aero shell or smooth exoskeleton of the shuttle um it the flaps and so forth were on the back end of the vehicle where they were more protected. And uh, but this is much more aggressive. Uh, it's exposed to much greater heat. And because it's a flap that needs to move, uh, you've got this joint that has to be flexible, but protected. And if you look at the images, uh, um, and I posted one just a little while ago on um, LinkedIn, on an article on LinkedIn about this. You can see that where you have the flap coming into the body of the vehicle, they've got tiles all around the edges and, and everything, and they're trying their best to protect it. But, uh, oh yeah, there it is. You can see the, the tiles on the flap, the tiles trying to protect the exposed area and uh you know they're doing a valiant effort but the material itself is too weak and keeping it attached is a problem on uh, ift3 lots and lots of the um, tiles came off on launch and i suspect this is the same here Elon Musk posted, I don't know if it's, I may have shared it in here. If you scroll further, uh, right in down there, mm -hmm. uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Yes. I'll hold it. Yeah. Despite loss of many tiles and a damaged flap, Starship made it all the way to a soft landing. And that's true. And he's admitting a loss of many tiles and the tiles haven't gotten near the attention because everybody's fixated on that 
pucky little flap that just wouldn't die. Uh, yeah, there's a, there is a, uh, somebody came up with a meme right away that was very funny. I thought, you know, in flap we trust. <laughs> yeah, the, the one thing I guess, and uh, you know, everyone says that that flap was quite unflappable. And in the end, it was able to. Flap. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and the other thing, I think we can say that based on symmetry, what we were seeing happening to that flap was probably happening to its partner on the other side and maybe the other ones um, uh, as well. So it's possible that all four of them were going through the same thing. And I find that amazing because I've tried hanging doors around here. And you know how sensitive door hinges to are to being just like something being a little bit off and the door just won't move? So remember, those are hinge mechanisms that are going through extreme heating and everything else, and yet they didn't bind up and somehow they're able to move. Now, I believe most of those tiles that Elon is talking about came off actually during the re-entry and not during the launch. My understanding is that during the launch, there was like, there was less than a half dozen tiles that came off during the launch. All of them, so, so that's already a huge improvement over the previous launches where a lot of them just fell in the ocean and were retrieved the next yeah. day. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there was quite a burgeoning little cottage industry on eBay selling uh, <laughs> IFT3 uh, heat shield Two tiles. <laughs> and not so much this time. So somebody found a better glue. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that worked. Yeah. But, you know, you still have to look at it. It didn't, it didn't effectively protect the flap. A lot did come mm -hmm. off during re-entry from various parts of the vehicle. Right. And, you know, Musk has been pushing the reusability and he commented um, that the problem with the space shuttle and NASA was the six month or more turnaround it took for the refurbishment of the tiles and other things. I mean, a lot of components on the uh, space shuttle that were intended to be reusable or not as reusable uh, in practice. And so, they, you know, what was supposed to be a very cost effective way to get things to orbit turned out to be more expensive and the turnaround was much less. I mean, in the early days of the shuttle, they were talking about, oh, well, we want 300, 500 missions out of this and they didn't get it. Uh, and uh, yeah. So there was a lot of delay, but what Musk's vision is, is he wants to build a starship a day in his mm -hmm. factory, a day, one, a day. We want to be a multi-planet civilization, ultimately be a multi-stellar civil, civilization, be out there among the stars. Like, you know, make science fiction, not fiction forever. Um, kind of make Star, Star Trek real. And That's he also wants them to be reusable yeah. with minimal fuss. And so I think the, uh, the heat shield material is just not cutting it for that intended goal of having something robust and reusable. It doesn't need a lot of work and yeah. rehab after it comes down. The other thing is he wants this. Uh, to be capable of going to the moon and to Mars and back. And lunar reentry uh, comes into the atmosphere much faster than Leo reentry. And Mars reentry is something like 38,000 miles an hour. Well, if it can't handle Leo is uh, very well, it's not going to handle lunar or Mars reentry. So. Let me just. Um go back to the point that you were making um, about the moon and Mars and potentially Uranus. And we'll play, we'll listen to what uh, Elon had to say that it was a bit of a tongue in cheek comment. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but, you know, help us understand how is it going to be different for Starship on the moon and Mars as opposed to Earth's re-entry? Yeah. Well, I mean, as far as when Starship goes to the lunar surface to land, there's no atmosphere. So you don't have this uh, ability to use uh, the ablative heating of reentry mm -hmm. 
to slow it down, which also heats it up, of course. Well, there's no atmosphere. So to land on the moon, it has to be 100% propulsion controlled, uh, just like the Apollo lander. You know, and this, uh, Mars is a little different. It has an atmosphere of a hundredth of, of an atmosphere, but it does have one. And it has been used in Mars missions to be able to uh, slow the rate of descent of vehicles approaching the Martian surface. Uh, what I'm most concerned with is when the vehicle comes back from the moon, like Apollo did, and mm -hmm. comes back from Mars, you're coming in at a much faster uh, speed. And so when it hits the Earth's atmosphere, the ablative effects are, are more extreme. The thermal heating is much greater. So you have right. a much higher temperature, much higher heat flux uh, load on the either ablative or non-ablative heat shield. And <laughs> you know, if you look at the space shuttle tiles, they were designed to handle Leo, and that and, and they kind of do. Mm -hmm. um, they were never designed to handle lunar return. Like you don't see Artemis having uh, space shuttle tiles on the bottom of the uh, Orion capsule, correct? Uh, because they can't. You know, the shuttle tiles can't take that kind of heat, so they use the old pica. Uh, uh, you know, ablative material from the Apollo days, which works great, unless you fabricate it incorrectly, like unfortunately Lockheed did. Yeah, <clears throat> but otherwise, and yeah, and and on the on the subject of Orion, I'm hoping we can get you again for a separate chat on that because there are problems with the heat shield there, and we'll try and break down uh, what that is. So I'm booking you here live, Ed. So you can't say no. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah. Now, now, now I think one solution Scott. to the, the lunar starship is the lunar starship won't actually uh, re return to the Earth's surface. It'll re return back to Earth orbit, and then I believe there'll probably be a crew transfer to another vehicle to to return to the surface. And that mm -hmm. sort of makes sense because um, since these vehicles are going to be going back and forth, and you've already got it out of this really deep uh, gravity well, why do you want to bring it down to the Earth's surface? And it's only mm. because of the th the items you want to return. You may be able to do it um, more effectively another way. The only mm. reason to probably bring it back down to the Earth's surface is that if you need to do a lot of refurbishment. So that means eventually you might think about, well, how do we do refurbishment in LEO? Is that going to be possible if you have fleets of these things going back and forth? So that means the Lunar Starship won't have any heat tiles on it, but it does have to be able to uh, make sure it's, it's able to get into LEO probably without dipping into the Earth's surface or doing anything like that to slow down. Potentially, you could use that, but then that means you need to have some sort of heat tiling. But if you get rid of the heat tiling, that means the mass overall of the system is a lot less, and you can then carry a lot more cargo uh, to the lunar surface and back. And then I would think for, for the Martian starship, you need heat tiles on there to be able to re-enter the uh, the, or enter the Martian atmosphere. You can't re-enter if you haven't been there already, right? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so you do the the entry there. You you need to have some sort of tiling. And the question is whether it's the same as coming from Leo, um, because you're probably coming in also at a pretty high velocity. That or if it's it, it's going to be something higher, which would require something much tougher to be able to do that. And again, when when you're going back and forth, there's wear and tear in these vehicles. So where's the yeah. maintenance being done? All right, we've got uh, Ben Inouye from NASA JPL. Uh, ben, great to have you back with us. I hope we've got a stable link with you. Um, so, all right, great. So we were talking about um, Starship's re-entry and the plasma, the brilliant plasma colors that we saw, what was causing uh, causing them, uh, the physics behind them. Um, you, you were, you were. I mean, the idea originated from our, from you really in our previous chat. So, um, what what are your high level thoughts about what we've been seeing? Very quickly before we catch up and move on. I mean, I, I think for first of all, it's we're seeing something amazing because uh, we can actually watch in live video uh, plasma being formed around the around a spacecraft, which you know that's that's new for uh, humanity. Yeah. So. Uh, it, it is also very interesting to watch. Uh, you know, I kind of use the color as a. Um, uh, proxy for 
uh, how much air they're, you know, how much atmosphere they're actually going through. So you can almost use it like a proxy for what their altitude is. Um, you almost create a color scale based off of, you know, for a known set of materials, uh, you could probably uh, associate colors with the altitude number you see changing on the screen there, which is kind of cool, um, as well as the speed. So, uh, you know, the, the brighter, bluer, whiter colors are going to be more and more energy being dissipated from uh, from this plasma plume that's around the starship. And um, so as you're going through thin air, even at high speeds, you'll see the lower energies that's where we start in that red color. And then you end with this brilliant violet purple, um, which is just an indicator of a lot of energy being dissipated and the starship slowing down significantly um, through a lot thicker air. So in general, you know, my, my two minute thoughts okay. there. Yeah. Scott, can I ask you a, a question about the radio transmission sure. through the, the plasma? Because we know from uh, the old days, you know, e even when the shuttle came in, is the plasma around it was so thick we could not uh, get any, receive any radio transmissions through it. And I assume it's because they were using ground stations and, and the, the plasma was between the spacecraft and the ground station, so nothing could go mm -hmm. through. Now, if you had the Starlink constellation at that, you know, way back then, would we have been able to receive live video from a Apollo, Gemini, the space shuttle because they would be beaming up? Or is there something else also different about the configuration of the Starship that it allows like some sort of window of opportunity for them to be able to actually do a transmission? That's a, it's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think from a pure, purely physics standpoint, um, the answer would be the, the former, right? Where you, if you had a transmitter and receiver in line of sight uh, that was in the wake of the plume, then it probably could have done it regardless of, you know, which vehicle was traveling through there. But I honestly don't know. Um, there may be something unique about the way that they are, you know, beam forming. Uh, there's been a lot of, yeah, advances in, in uh, directional waves uh, through interference patterns in the last several decades. So, that could be part of it. It could be the sheer number of uh, receiving stations that Starlink is actually forming behind it, so it doesn't have to point at a specific spot anymore. Um, but but it's it's a good question. Um, I I if I guess, then yeah, if Starlink was around during the Apollo era, we would have been able to see some of these uh, live videos as well. Then, but I, I really don't know where I, actually. Elon Musk has been tweeting about this over the last several missions where we've been able to see spectacular imagery like this. And uh, he is crediting the presence of thousands of Starlink satellites for being able to uh, have these uh, images and have all this telemetry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. And they had a little, a brilliant little watermark at the top right corner of the screen. Uh, mm -hmm. saying visuals through Starlink, which I thought was well. just fantastic. <laughs> what a great opportunity for branding. Right, right. Free marketing. Free marketing. When the whole and world was sold a few. On Starlink 5, there'll be the I mean, uh, IFT 5, there'll be the little Starlink logo, and next to it, maybe Coca Cola or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> you yep. need Coca Cola yep. in space, don't you? <laughs> Yeah, and I guess the CEO Especially, of Coca-Cola gets a lifetime premium plus membership <laughs> on X. <laughs> yeah, this is as they, get a, they get a red check mark. A red check mark. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> all right. So, um, well, Elon's as you've rightly said it. Elon's been, um, you know, uh, uncharacter. I mean, he's, he's he's he tweets a lot. He says a lot, but um, I think he's in a very very nice a good space a very happy space uh, after iot4 he's been chatting a lot uh, doing a few interviews i was so happy uh, scott to see ellie ellie get an interview with uh, elon and she did a great job so uh, kudos to her and i'll i'll paste a link below in the comments to ellie's interview with uh, elon if you've missed it out please do watch it it's a brilliant interview and i'm really happy for ellie but um okay so he also Elon also spoke to Adam Burrows from uh, Princeton I think um and he had some interesting comments to make in when he was explaining why um SpaceX chose stainless steel 
So let's let's kind of take a listen. Seem to many that I believe you chose a stainless steel um, or the vehicle. I could be wrong, but what 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 were the uh, technical and engineering reasons for that? I uh, sure that that's uh, I think a very interesting question because um, uh, to a lot of people intuitively they would think of uh, steel as being heavy. Um, uh, and rockets need to be light. So, well, that seems pretty a pretty odd choice, picking a, a heavy sounding thing for rockets, especially orbital rockets that need to be very light. The interesting thing about a 300 series st uh, stainless steel is that uh, its properties at cryogenic temperatures, uh, its, its strength properties increase dramatically. So if you were to look at the material properties at room temperature, you'd be like, oh, it's not that great. But now go now go uh, look at the temperature properties at uh, liquid oxygen temperature. Oh, actually much stronger. Uh, also no, uh, no no meaningful increase in brittleness. So you have, it still high, has high toughness uh, at cryogenic temperatures. Uh, it is much stronger depending on how, how cold you go, up to twice as strong. Uh, and then, then if you, you can also cold work it. So you get if you if you go sort of full hard cold work, um, and, uh, and and do the final bit of cold work. Uh, at cryogenic temperatures, uh, you get uh, outstanding uh, strength properties, which are roughly equal to an advanced carbon fiber. All right, so that's a lengthy interview, but um, essentially the choice of stainless steel and then the SpaceX developing their own um, SS30X um, or 300X, is it, if I'm not mistaken? What do you make of that, um, Ed? Uh, yeah, I mean, he's absolutely right about challenge of trying to do a carbon fiber epoxy composite uh, fuselage uh, for the whole rocket uh, it is much easier to uh, produce it out of a metal structure, uh, particularly a stainless steel. And it's the SX300 that they have is a, a high chrome stainless. It's a good material. Uh, it, you know, if you're going to make the structure uh, out of this material, he, he cited the main advantages from, from his standpoint is in the manufacturing and the production of these huge missile cases. I mean, these are enormous. Yeah. And like our ICBM missile cases are made out of uh, metal. They're, they're not made out of carbon fiber epoxy. Mm -hmm. uh, and this thing is so much larger and because it's the structure of the vehicle, it has to be strong and it, yeah, it really has to be made out of one piece. And it's a very different problem from uh, gluing tiles of a heat shield onto the outer surface of a vessel. It's a very different um, problem. Now, the advantage to this is that even though you would never make a heat shield out of stainless steel for you know leo re-entry or lunar re-entry anything like that it's a much higher temperature material than the aluminum frame or fuselage of the space shuttle or if you had a fuselage that was made out of carbon epoxy and, and musk is 100 percent right the epoxy is flammable under the right temperature and conditions. It will char, oxidize, burn. Um, it, it, there's a lot wrong with it. Uh, a high temperature stainless steel alloy like what he's using has an additional advantage of being able to take some heat. Now, did that help on IFT4? And the short answer is yes. In areas where tiles came off, um, at least the superstructure provided a secondary um, heat shielding uh, behavior to help uh, prolong the life of the vehicle uh, on reentry, even when you know tiles came off during during the reentry. Uh, had he used aluminum or something else, uh, lower temperature, then it would have melted. So. Mm -hmm. It's a great secondary heat shield backup material. Uh, now, obviously, if that secondary heat shield material, stainless steel, comes into play, it means your primary heat shield failed. So that's a problem. That is definitely a failure. But you didn't lose the whole vehicle. You were able to you know, bring it back 
home yeah. to Earth safely. So, which is tremendous. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of there's a lot to that answer. Um, yeah. You know, I also found it interesting because just after the after the launch, um, Elon uh, commented saying that um, they tried experimenting with one uh, heat tile. I think it was towards the skirt of uh, yeah. of the rockets on Starship. Uh, and I think he, he he said it was a thinner tile, if I'm not mistaken, or, or at a different composition. Um, do you do you have any more insights on that, guys? Well, I know you're correct. He left two tiles off, and he had one tile where it was thinner, and so it was inset from the the surrounding tiles. Correct. Uh, to just to see what would happen, and not in strategic locations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, but hey, now I think, yeah, Ben, go ahead. Going, going back, real quick, going back to the the stainless steel choice there, you know, I I do think that, um, not mentioned but very important is this this rapid iteration approach they're doing to testing the stainless steel is one of the most forgiving metals to weld. Um, you know, if you go with aluminum, you need the you know very specialized equipment. Uh, the the ability to do it quickly is, um, well, the ability is very difficult with aluminum. Um, you, you got to use a, a TIG welding or friction stir welding type process, but they could they could literally go hire you know guys out of the oil field, um, give them a, a a stick welder and, and have them start building a rocket with stainless steel. Um, so it, it's a, a really good material, especially if you want to prototype quickly like you did. Um, you don't want to have to manufacture in a giant clean room, which they don't. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think Elon mentioned that later on in the interview that it's a lot easier to attach other items on there. You, you can yep. just weld them right on. And if you, you think about it, I mean, the, you know, th those scenes we always see in the Star Wars universe shows that even they, they gave up on carbon fiber because they were always going around welding things together. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could you could even reach further in your imagination and say, all right, well, when we start harvesting uh, elements from asteroids, are we going to be able to find carbon fiber bases or we're going to find a lot of iron. Um, I think that answer is pretty, pretty clear. So I don't know if he's thinking about that, but um, if that was part of the calculus, then it's certainly easier to get the materials for stainless out there and uh, the asteroid belt. Yeah, I, and you're right about aluminum. You have to use what's called a heliarc because when aluminum uh, is heated in air, it produces alumina, uh, Al2O3 oxide, mm -hmm. which is a very high melting temperature oxide. And uh, a heliarc is the only way to hit it with a temperature hot enough to melt and vaporize the alumina that forms on the aluminum to make the weld. And uh, it's a, I've done it. It's a pain in the ass. Yeah. Can I say yeah. that on your webcast? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But basically, you need all these exotic shielding gases. <laughs> with these different materials because as soon as you make them very hot, they want to oxidize. So yeah. you need to get the oxygen yeah. out of the environment and you either use something like argon around there. You could um, also do uh, what I think they call like submersive welding, which is literally they put sand over it, the arc is underneath mm -hmm. it to go along, whatever you can do, try to do to keep it out. So it's definitely a lot easier. And even it's hard. Know, stainless steel is a little <laughs> bit trickier hard. than just pure steel, but it's, it's still, mm -hmm. it's not as hard as aluminum and some of the others to weld. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's look at what uh, Elon's been saying about uh, IFT5. Um, and this is Elon on a, on a stream. Um, I love the fact not that... Just that uh, not just is, any stream. Not just, just any destroying stream. zombies with, with the dog yeah. and companion. I was yeah. clutched that this morning. is pretty funny. Next launch, hopefully... Next launch, uh, Starship launch is, launch is probably in about a month. Uh, we we have to take we're we're, we're going to replace the whole heat shield on the ship, so the new uh, heat shield uh, tile uh, is about twice as strong as the ones that were on the last flight. So um, and we want to put uh, an an ablative secondary structure like basically ablative protection. Okay, I think uh, what I make is is the last time he was asked to, uh, after IFT three, I think it was like oh, in something like six weeks, and ended up being you know closer to what 
two and a half months. So more than mm -hmm. a month beyond the prediction. <laughs> so if he says about a yep. month, technically that means four weeks. doesn't mean three weeks. I think it means four, five, or six weeks. Then add a month to it. <laughs> it will be the same. But, you know, so, maybe it's maybe it's a Mars month because that's actually, you know. About, yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's what I've come to determine. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That the, um, the, the other thing is that, you know, I don't know if they've already started to make those preparations and changes or whether they waited to see the results of this to decide what they're doing. So that's mm -hmm. going to be a lot to do pretty quick. The question is, is what's the primary purpose of IFT5? Is it to catch the booster mm. or is it to check this new heat shield system? And is, is I think kind of don dominate the, the, the time frame or the other, or are they thinking of getting both at the same time? Yeah. All right. Or so maybe Elon re shared... wrapped a relight. Yeah. Well, Elon shared the uh, right this clip. Yeah, how cool is that? That's so yeah, cool. now, now, evidently, gets, those gets me every were, time. were hiding in, in plain sight uh, around yeah. uh, the, the Boca Chica area, that there were some pictures that someone had of them. And so they spaced the buoys around where they're, and that tells us they it landed where they expected because it's not like those buoys. Exactly, that was my next question. Yeah. Yep. So what do you, what Scott? What do you make of this? Uh, uh, have they hit uh, a sufficient yes. level of accuracy that they can now yes, yes, bring it yes, back to? Yes. The, yes. So, uh, so basically, he said that they they hit the location precisely with a the booster. They were about six hmm. kilometers off with the starship, and I have I suspect that they were sh short. Because they probably had so much excess drag coming in there, they probably couldn't make it quite as far. Yeah, but you know that that's okay. The fact that they get that, that they were able to land at all is amazing. And what's important, mm -hmm. of course, is with the booster. That's what they want to catch first. Eventually, they want to catch the star. That's going to take a while. They're going to have to get pinpoint accuracy on that first. But the the booster. Now, some people were concerned because, as you may have seen from both the live stream and what they showed us there, there was an engine rud coming on down here. So one of yeah. the outer ring engines, just one of them, went out soon after startup and a lot of people were concerned that well until they get that right it means they shouldn't do it and i'm like no that actually means they're ready to have to do it because it means they have the redundancy in there redundancy right. all right the whole idea <laughs> is that the control system was able to take over for the fact that one of the engines went out the other engines were able to thrust up as they were required to be able to, to handle it and take over that's the whole idea of the extra engines on there now the one theory I have on why that may have gone out is that you'll notice it was not vertical when it launched, when it started. Mm -hmm. And right. so what happens is you're coming down with pretty much an empty tank. Now the oxygen tank is, has its own header tank. It's completely full. So you don't have the problem, but the methane is actually being drawn from a, a tank like this. And you have down here, what would be, let's say all the manifolds that obviously have a lot more than what's here on my bottle, but each one of them is a separate feed line that goes in there. If you're coming down vertically like this, everything is fine. But if mm -hmm. you're tipped a little bit horizontal, you see what's happening right. to my manifold over there? Yeah. It right. might ingest a bubble or something like that. And I don't know if it's coincidence that the engine that went out was the one that was up on that high side. So I suspect mm -hmm. either uh, there was like some sloshing around, maybe the angle was a bit steeper than they wanted to be, or they had used up a bit more methane than they expected. But I suspect it might be something like that. Hopefully they have the telemetry to find out because that thing's on the bottom of the ocean right now and they won't be able to do an analysis of it. Hmm. Interesting. Right? Yeah, it's, I, you know, Scott was I, down there a, for the launch. So yeah, you see a lot of things that you know we don't necessarily did, catch on to. Did it did it go to the bottom? I was thinking the tanks would keep it afloat. They they, they all, all of them they scuttle right afterwards. So they had no intention of oh, recovery, okay. which is a shame. You know, I can understand way out in the Indian Ocean, but my understanding is that uh, all the other boosters in this one, that they had to have a way of being able to scuttle it. Uh, I haven't heard oh, so they like I'm a, They used the, the FDS, they, I believe, to just to sh rip it open. And oh, they did? It sinks. Yeah. 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 That's okay. That, it, that it would be Because otherwise, <laughs> yeah, you, you need something to blow a hole in it. And either they go mm -hmm. out there and just do target practice, you know. <laughs> or, you know, they, they detonate it. So more than likely, they, they would just say, well, we got the FTS system there for a reason. Let's just go ahead and use it. But mm. otherwise, it should really float for a while before it, yeah. it sinks, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, I absolutely. Think so. But they wanted to guarantee that it sank. That's that's the whole thing. Yeah. It mm. probably was going to sink anyways, but they had to guarantee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So what what do you make um, about, of Elon's comments about uh, adding an, an ablative mechanism, uh, whether it's a layer or something else? I found that very interesting because correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but right now the heat tiles are not ablative. Correct. Yeah, that's right. The current heat tiles are non-ablative. Adding a layer of ablative on top of them uh, is a way of, uh, it's a band-aid. It, it dissipates heat. And it may be something he's going to primarily uh, place on the joints where the flaps connect to the fuselage uh, as a way of protecting them because those joints are very vulnerable. And uh, we said this all along. Now, as far as timing, he is already solving yesterday's problem today. Uh, he, he launched IFT4 with the system they have now, but he started work on these tiles that are two times stronger than the current tiles based on prior test data and concerns, like the fact that they were falling off the vehicle. Well, that was a red flag a while ago. So you don't wait till the last minute. It takes months to produce uh, 20,000 tiles. I mean, this is not something you do overnight. And so he's, you know, IFT5 will solve the problems they were concerned with on IFT3. And, uh, you know, and, and some of the problems they anticipated seeing on this mission. Uh, he's great, and his team is great at looking ahead. Um, and one of the things about the, the type of tile they're using is it isn't a single composition. You can make it stronger, uh, tougher. It won't be as light, but you have yes, to so make the trade. I, I, that, that was going to be my follow-up question. How does this now affect the, what is it, the payload capacity and all of it? Because if you're adding an extra layer, that's extra mass that you can't shed, mm -hmm. by the way. Right. And the question is, I, I think it's only going to be in the critical areas that may not necessarily be throughout the entire vehicle. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is, is the ablative layer going to be the top layer or the bottom layer? Looks like the top. Okay. Interesting. And, okay. and that makes sense because that's the part that goes away. And if you're intending for the vehicle to be reusable, you want to uh, quickly apply a new ablative uh, layer for the next flight, not not have to redo the tiles, mm -hmm. uh, which you would like them to be permanently attached. Right. And, uh, what what is the yeah. what is the application process for the uh, you know an ablative material in this type of application? Is it like a spray on or aren't they like goops basically like paste? Well, it, there's different ways of doing it. Uh, the best ablative in um, solid rocket motors is called EPDM. It's been around since the 1960s. It's EPDM rubber, and it's a highly efficient ablative that's used on the inner walls of solid rocket boost motors. And, uh, you know, once again, for ICBMs and, and other things. And this material as a, a sheet of rubber could be attached to the surface. Oh, with the benefit of keeping the tiles on. Yeah. Yes. You you'd glue the rubber on top of the tile, basically. Yeah, but you'd still you'd still be kind of wrapped around it. So it would give it a little bit of yeah. hoop strength and everything else. Yeah. Not much. Yeah. Not but as much. far as so EVDM is designed to char and it gets weak, mm. which is fine. Um, so this, so as as I understand it, this ablative layer would be needed only for starships that are re-entering Earth's atmosphere, right? You wouldn't necessarily need it for uh, the versions of Starship for the Moon and Mars. Uh, I think uh, at least well, for the Moon, no. For Mars, maybe. Mars, you need some sort of yeah. heat shield. But Whether would the, the current heat shield be enough? I I think that's a good question. We. Um, it, it seems like it would if all the tiles stayed in place and no leakages occurred. That, that's just a guess, mm -hmm. though. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, now, I've noticed one other design change that they're talking about, but I don't think it's going to make it on IFT5, but maybe it's the V2 version. 
is that they're going to take the flaps and move them more to the leeward side. Yes. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I'm surprised they maybe didn't do that already, why they wanted to have right in the center, maybe because they just thought for aerodynamic forces and control, it made more sense. But now it looks like by putting it back, it would be out of a little bit of the... But Ed, do you think it's going to make that much of a difference? Because then the joints will be back a little bit further and they may not be as heavily exposed. It'll help. <laughs> It'll help. Right now, he's got those uh, very uh, vulnerable flaps hanging right out in the hottest part of the re-entry uh, uh, ablative heating. And um, yeah, I think uh, I, putting the flaps leeward will help. Now, the question is, it'll help with their survivability. But how does it affect the aerodynamics of right. how well do they do their job yeah. uh, controlling yeah. the vehicle? Right. And that, that's not my field. So mm. I, I've got to go in just question. one minute, but there's a, a quick point I wanted to, to make about yeah. some of uh, Elon's pass. Um, he had mentioned going, you know, I'm not saying I believe this, but he said Mars in three years. And I saw a lot of tweets indicating, well, that's not possible. It's not in line with the synodic period of Mars. Um, but I, I think it's, even though I don't believe that they're going to be ready in three years, it's important to note that that three or the two, uh, 24 month window that we launched to Mars is actually just the, it's an efficient home in transfer that we use. And if you have a powerful enough rocket, your launch year does not matter and you can get to Mars in a time efficient way at any launch point. You just have to have enough rocket to do it. So um, I think that was an important, an important thing that, um, yeah, because it's, it's easy to say, all right, well, that's not in the synodic, you know, you can go look up a chart of when the optimal launch windows are and his three year estimate is not in that, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I think if he's planning to have a powerful enough rocket, then he can go whenever he wants. Just got to build it first. Yeah. Anyway, I got to sign off, gentlemen. It's been great talking. Well, we'll it's talk always great to have you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Nice meeting you, Ben. <laughs> you too, Ed. All right. So I quickly want to just ask you this one last question before we kind of wrap up. And what we were and what we're seeing here, and if I can just add this. So this is the forward flap, correct? Do we have? Any information or any insight into what happened to the, the bottom ones? Is, did something similar happen? And if, that's, that's if it's assumption. these flaps that are going to be moved back to the leeward side or all four, what's your take, Scott? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Is that whether, you know, I, again, I'm assuming they're all seeing the same conditions. Yeah, the forward versus rear flaps might see something a little bit different, but port and starboard should be seeing absolutely identical. Uh, I don't think they've yeah. rolled it in any particular way. So it was having to survive that. So both of those flaps were unflappable uh, throughout this whole period. <laughs> the other question I was going to have for Ed is like, is the, the heat the most intensity at the at the root of where the flap is connected to the um, the spacecraft, where the hinge joint is? And if you took the hinge joint and actually moved it out a little bit, would that make any difference? So let, let's say you, you say had like the root part fixed and you went halfway out with a flap and only flap that part. Would you see the same level of heating midway out there as you would right next to the fuselage? Worse. Worse heating. Much wow. Worse. Okay. Even worse. worse. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That is, that is definitely no bueno. No. Wow. It, wow. You, you get some protection by having the hinge mechanism of the flap being right up against the tubular shape of the uh, hull. Mm -hmm. But it's not enough, obviously. OK, OK, that's interesting. So the, the heating gets worse the further out you go towards the tip. Yeah. And if you notice, I, I love that video. You keep showing it. There's one part where a huge chunk of presumably heat shield comes off the back end of that flap yeah um and i think really, that's what hits the camera hmm. yeah, oh know, big chunks yeah. in fact i saw hexagonal yeah bits looking at this again more closely some of the pieces coming off were hexagons which is <laughs> the Definitely generic tough. shape of 
Starship Trials. Yeah. Interesting. Well, all right, gentlemen, it's been uh, wonderful having you. Uh, I just any closing thoughts of as we move towards uh, IFT five on Elon time. Um, Scott, let's begin with you because you are our man on the ground. Are you going, are you planning to go okay, back well, it, for IFT five? Well, it sort of depends depends what it is. I, I, I would like you know, as it was, the timing worked out lucky for me that it was a little bit delayed. That was like absolutely a perfect week for me to be able to go. Um, now you know a month that's that's pushing it. I mean that that's like almost Fourth of July weekend. So I don't think it's going to be there. Uh, I suspect the earliest would be late July, early August. Uh, and Elon has said that you know there's a 50 50 chance that they they catch it, uh, the, the, the booster. And yeah. you know with odds like that, you know they they have to be ready to make sure that when it comes down, if they miss the catch, that it's not going to do something to set the program back because there's a lot mm -hmm. of critical infrastructure around there they have to guard against and just make sure that whatever goes wrong uh, is able to be contained. Yeah, and do you think it's gonna they're gonna try and catch it with Megazilla too? It. But, you know, if they're going that aggressive with one month, probably not. Then they're going with that one. Uh, now, there there had been some um, some some discussions and rumors of other thing that the second one had to be ready before they attempted to do the catch, without necessarily yeah. saying it meant they were going to use it to catch. But this kind of important to get this the ball rolling with that to maybe make mm -hmm. sure they have a second one in case something happens to the first one. It's not really right. clear that if you're not catching it with a second one, why you would need to to urgently start building it or, or get it into some um, state of, of preparedness. Um, that is a possibility because some engineers had actually said that, it, you know, that is a potential scenario that they could look at. They've been looking at all of them. Um, the, the, the one as it's designed right now that's being built is to be built as like a full launch tower that could also mm -hmm. be used for launching and catching. Yes. Right now, if it's going to be a really early one, I would say the, they're going to catch it with the first tower. If it slips a couple of months, then as a possibility, they might think about doing that. Or maybe not, because maybe the new one is like so advanced. It's like, that's the one we don't want to lose because it's got all our new <laughs> stuff in there. And we don't care yeah. about something happening to the, the other one. But so long as we know that yeah. the second tower is well along its way, if something happens to the first one, we know we can still launch um, our, our next yeah, there's a lot of month or two. There have been a lot of design upgrades. There, there's uh, a reason for a redundancy stuff. on that second tower, and yeah. I haven't quite been yeah. able to figure it out. At first, it yeah. only made sense to catch with it just to make sure you preserve the first one. Um, but mm -hmm. if they're really building the full tower, then it just makes sense that like, oh, we know we're confident that if something goes wrong for the first one, we're ready to go out of the second one. Yeah. Ed, um, what are your thoughts uh, going into IFT5? Well, <clears throat> based on the clip you showed, Musk says, they're going to try out new tiles that are twice as strong as the current mm -hmm. ones, which you can do. You can do with the space shuttle like tile material. And I presume he already he already planned that uh, months ago. Uh, I'm I'm sure the tiles coming off, you know, uh, each launch. I mean, they weren't even staying on the vehicles in IFT one and two. They're falling off all over the place. IFT three, they fell off. They fell off during launch. Uh, we didn't get to see whether they stayed on during reentry because it didn't happen. But it doesn't matter. He knew. Uh oh, if this can't even survive the launch, we need a new one. And so they already started their factory working on, you know, a generation two of basically lightweight silica tiles, and you can make them stronger. I mean. Uh, I know how to make them stronger, and they won't be as lightweight, but they don't need to be. I mean, his tiles are too thick, first of all. Second of all, because he's got a, a stainless steel shell, uh, the, the back surface of the tiles don't need to be that cool. Hmm. You know, that's important. He, his, his vehicle uh, can take the heat. So there's some design considerations. All right. Well, Elon yeah, and sure SpaceX when he said guys, stronger. you can reach out to Ed. Yeah. Sorry, Scott, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So so when Elon said that they're going to be twice as strong, you're meaning the, the, the strength, its ability to be broken or not broken, as opposed to the, the durability to heat. Correct. It's, it doesn't have anything to do with the their heat ability. No, 
It'll be this, stay on. essentially the same material, just in slightly the, updated. The, the problem that's the problem is that the, the the resistance to heat. The the problem is staying on, and the reason they're not staying on is they're breaking off. So that's why they need to be stronger. Correct. Uh, but even if they stay on, they still have to be uh, really resistant to the heat. Mm -hmm. Which, Which we yeah. believe they are sufficient enough, at, at least maybe in 90% of the places. There's probably a few places where yeah. the hot spots are extremely hot. Yeah. Wow, interesting. Great. It's been wonderful having you, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I look forward to... Our next chat, uh, we, there's a lot to talk about in the run-up to IFT5, but also, uh, Ed, as I said, um, Orion, uh, hopefully we'll get that. And Boeing Starliner. Well, there's a lot of concerns about the return of Boeing Starliner. So we hope that uh, yeah. everything goes off safe. It's a very exciting time. Lots of uh, flights, Starliner, uh, of course, Orion, Artemis mission, everything SpaceX is doing. And don't forget, you've got Blue Origin out there. I pray someday they're going to start launching. You know. Yes, indeed. It would be nice yeah. to to have Blue Origin also compete. Competition is always good. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for your time, gentlemen. It's been wonderful having you. We'll talk soon.